Good afternoon. I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the title of this is called A Look of Compassion. Um, a Look of Compassion. We're going to pull our message from Mark chapter 6, verse 34. Uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Before we begin this message, I want to pray over it uh, so if everybody could bow their head. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you've given me here tonight. I know this has been laying on my heart for a while, and um, I just ask you to Give me the clarity of thought or whatever to, to be able to proclaim uh, what you would have me to say. And that people would get more of a vision of compassion when they look around them, look around them to the many people that are lost here. Just many of them family members, many of them friends. All this we ask and give you the glory. All this we ask in your heavenly name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All righty. These... The compassion is our focus point of this message. Uh, the definition of um, compassion is just, it says it's a simplistic um, pity and concern of, for the suffering or misfortunes of others. I was looking back over my life um, when I was putting this together, and I remember one of the first signs that I realized of compassion was that of my mother. Um, I had back surgery back... Um, and I was like 14. Um, I was in the hospital. I couldn't move. Uh, the doctors had to move me back and forth for bed sores. Um, I had, had to, I couldn't walk, couldn't breathe, couldn't do anything. And my grandma, uh, my mom was there right beside of me. Right after the surgery, she helped me to be able to walk again. She would take my hand and she would lead me up the road and it was painful. It was, um, but, um, I think compassion was that. Uh, another compassion was my grandmother. I had my granddad passed away. I had life, uh, just different occasions. And she was always there for me uh, to lend a ear and to, to just be there for me. Uh, so that was my signs of compassion. Uh, to understand compassion is to have somebody actually know what they're going through. Like a loss of a loved one you can have compassion over because you yourself have felt it. Um, family issues, somebody that's going through something similar to me, that's similar to them, you can have compassion on them. Sickness, you can have compassion. Friendship can grow out of turmoil, some good friendship, some bad friendship. Um, in order to understand why Jesus looked on with compassion, uh, if we go to Mark chapter 6, verse 33. Mark chapter 6, verse 33. It's a verse right before that. That's it. Uh, the verse before we read, and the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and a foot hither out of all the cities, and out went them and came together unto him. Mark chapter 6, verse 44, which is just a couple of verses down, it says, and they that um, eat of the loaves was about 5,000. So here we can, we can understand that he looked over about 5,000 men. And in, verse, in Mark chapter 6, verse 33, it said, and some knew him. I wonder how many of the 5,000 that was around him that actually knew Jesus. Uh, we can see in John chapter 6, verse 2, if you go there with me, John chapter 6, verse 2. It says, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them, which were diseased. But it said that he looked on them with compassion. He didn't look on them that they weren't sick. He just looked at them and he saw sheep without a shepherd. Um, have you followed me with Matt, uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36? Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. It 
says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. In this, we see Matthew bringing two different aspects into it. Fainted, which is a simple way of saying physical exhaustion, and scattered, which just means that they were not united. Uh, let's move to Mark chapter 6, verses 39 through 40. It's Mark chapter 6, 39 through 40. I'm setting up for what he was looking on to. So if you just bear with me while we go through a couple of scriptures. In Mark chapter 6, verse 39 through 40, and he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. Now, let's put all this together. There was 5,000 people there. Some knew Jesus. Mostly they came to be healed. They were tired and scattered, and Jesus brought them together to teach them uh, many things and to feed them, looking on with compassion. We live in a world that is full of tired, scattered people searching for healing, some knowing Jesus, and some just searching for a miracle. Today we're going to go over the three P's that is essential in understanding compassion. The first is personal. Um... The reason I think I'm more nervous tonight than any other night is uh, I like to talk about myself in this and I don't really like doing that. Um, I guess like many people, we wasn't born saved. Um, but I was a good churchgoer. I was 20 years, I went to church. Um, I was a member of the council. I helped with communion. Uh, I was attended every church event, uh, to help, out at, to help out at the church as many as I could. Uh, the rest of the week, I never touched my Bible. I never consulted with God except for things that I wanted Him to do. Um, I was baptized in, as an infant, and I was told that I had the golden ticket to heaven. I had no conscience when it came to bad behavior. I was told, just ask for forgiveness and make sure you, go, you make it to church on Sunday. I came to know Christ one night eating a bowl of popcorn, drinking a glass of tea, and watching a guy on TV talk about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Never occurred to me that I could have actually a relationship with Jesus. I just thought Jesus was this guy that answered my problems and when something was too bad, I went to him. Or, But the rest of the time, it was up to me to deal with everything. I remember... Um, my grandmother would read the Bible, and I would come downstairs sometimes, and I'd just see a cup of coffee and a Bible. And she'd have it open to different verses. And I talked to the neighbor, and they actually had a contest who could read the Bible in a year. They did it every year. And she exempted everything that I think a Christian should be, and I was far from that. Um, I recall those times with, with my grandmother, and I knew that I was far from that type of person. When I asked God to forgive me of the different attributes that I had and um, I asked him to reveal himself to me, I said, I need help. I, I really don't know you. I've been singing praises to you. I've been praying to you, but I, don't, I haven't really known you for 20-some years. I realized in that that, there was, that I wasn't the only one that sinned. Uh, Romans 3.23, you probably don't even have to turn to it. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 5, 8, we talked about this morning. But God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I remember going to church later on that week and that month, and I actually paid attention, believe it or not, to the church. I actually wanted to read the Bible, and I had a hunger and a thirst um, for God that I'd never had before. I met my future wife, uh, Jolene, a few months later, and I got my first Bible. It was a Charles Reary Bible. I was so happy that I took the Bible and I brought it to my parents, my brother, and I said, look what amazing Bible that I got. They didn't care. The only one that seemed to care was the one that showed me compassion all those years before. I was listening to a recent sermon by the name of S.M. Lockridge. Uh, it was a sermon in 1982. He explained some of the lifestyles of the people back then. He said that people found peace 
of mind and pills. They tried to eat their way into ecstasy, drink their way into pleasure, smoke their way into subtle nerves, puff their way into popularity, push their way into power, bully their way into friendship, bum their way into world peace. Not much has changed since 1982 when he looked around and he was able to see that. Genesis 6, verses 5 through 6, God looks over the world after he makes it and he sees how awful and evil that it is. If you want my turn there with me, Genesis 6, 5 through 6. In this passage it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. I wonder, has the world changed that much? Did he look on you with compassion when you were lost? Was you fainting when he saw you? A few years ago, probably eight or so, we went up the road and this guy said, I'm too bad to go to church. If I went to church, the place would burn down. I had a little chuckle, but he had more understanding of his way and his evilness than I did, and I was a churchgoer for 20-some years. He understood what he did didn't mix with church. There are so many people that go to church and yet are some of the vilest people that there is, but yet they go to church and it makes them have a way of, I guess, a righteousness. But when he said that he wasn't right, I understood that he was further along than I was for those many years. Do you know what I've come to realize? There is no good people that go to church. If only good people were allowed, the pews would be empty. We know this from Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. To get even more personal, how is God looking over this world now? Do you think it's with compassion? <coughs> People who have been dying of many variable diseases for years. There was one that I looked, it was off of a website, it says the Black Death, it was, uh, the toll was 75 to 200 million and it ravaged Europe, Africa, and Asia. That was between the years of 1346 and 1353. The flu pandemics that started in 1889 to 1890 was 1 million. There was another flu pandemic that came out in 1918. That toll was 20 to 50 million. The Asian flu was 1956 to 1958. That killed 2 million. HIV and AIDS pandemic at its peak in 2005 to 2012, 36 million people. And if you throw in cancer, road accidents, homicide, drug overdoses, there are many that looked at God and we question him. How can a loving God allow so much death? How can he not do anything to stop it? Where is he and why doesn't he care? I can't answer that question. But the Bible says that it has a way to cut to the heart. If we look at Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and it is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I want to look today at somebody that went through a lot of hardship in his life, and that's Job. Um, we go to Job chapter 1 verses 9 through 11. Job chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Now this is a conversation that God is having with Satan over Job. Job chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, it says, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth thou thou fear God for naught? Has not they made a hedge about him, and made his house, and about all that he hath at every side, that thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance 
has increased in the land, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. And we move down to verse 13. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house. We'll go down to verse 19. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they all are dead, and I only I have escaped to tell thee. And we understand that, that Satan looked at him and he saw that there was a hedge of protection. And then we read in 13 and 19 that his whole family, well his wife is still alive, we'll get to that, but his whole family was dead in an instant. I would say that it would be something that would be out of the norm and he has everything protected and he, that he doesn't really see anything happening. Now let's go to verses 20 and 21 of the same chapter. Uh, Job's reaction. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return hither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not nor chose nor charged God falsely or foolishly. I guess that's the ideal response that you have when facing different circumstances. You want to give God uh, no question, no remorse, no, I guess, attack. But you're thinking, um, and naked shall I return hither, and the Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. People that understand God can take different things and be able to apply it to understand that God ultimately has control over everything. Now Satan goes a bit further. Job chapter 2, verse 5. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. We go down to the next verse, verse 6 and 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. Verse 7, So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job the sore, the sore bowls from the sole of his foot unto his crown. So from, from his feet to his head. And this is his wife's reaction uh, to Job. Uh, Job chapter 2 verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou not still retain that integrity? Curse God and die. Verse 10. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive? Good at the hand of God, and shall not we receive evil? And all this did Job sin not with his lips. We see Job suddenly lost somebody in his life, and then got stricken with sickness. Now what if you knew what was happening? What kind of reaction should you have then? God looks at another instance in 2 Samuel Chapter 12, verses 16 through 23. Turn there. 2 Samuel 12, chapter 12, 16 through David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted, and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of the house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth. But he would not, neither did he eat bread from them. And it came to pass as the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of the Lord feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we speak unto him, and he would not hearken unto the voice. How will then he vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? The David saw that his servants whispered, and David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto the servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and, charged, and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord. 
and worshiped. And then he came to his house, and when he required that, they set bread before him, and he did eat. And then said his servants unto him, What thing is that that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while he was yet alive, but when he, the child was dead, thou didn't rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? We see two different examples. One example that we have is a righteous man with the death of his family. And then the other one, this was because of the sin with Bathsheba, um, that the child came and he said that he was going to take the child and he died. So knowing that the child was going to die, uh, he still came up and worshipped. Now if you follow with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 28. This is the hardships that Paul went through. Second Corinthians chapter 11, 23 to 28. He says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. And labors more abundant, and, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I, forty stripes save one. There was I beaten with rods once, and was I stoned there. I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have uh, been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings oft in cold and nakedness, beside these things that are without, which come unto me daily, the care of all the churches. There's many things that in life you don't want to deal with. Um, many things are inevitable. Um, most of us don't want to have to deal with anything. I first came to this church about 10 years ago. And when I came here, there was a bunch of children that was here. Some were young and seven, and some was 16 through 17. I got to know most of them. And the more I got to know them, I got to understand more about their home life. And um, I thought mine was bad, but then I got to learn more about theirs, and theirs was a whole lot worse. Um, there's some that came here that was dirty, some had lice, some had smelling of spoke. Uh, some really didn't even want to go home. On certain occasions it was really hard for them to, they wanted to be taken home last. Um, we only had a few hours with them a week that we could share the Word of God, share love, share love and compassion, uh, share with them a different life that they, that they deal with. We would carve pumpkins with them, we would eat with them, we would have competitions with them. Uh, we would do everything that we could to be able to share uh, the love of Christ with them and the love that they need to have. There was one child, i never forget it, I was coming in and this was one of the child that I got off of a roof in the back. She was playing, she was just <laughs> acting like a kid. She was like, get down from there. And she was like, I ain't doing that. And, uh, but she, I came in there and I was the star at the piano and I'm like, any minute she's just going to wreck the piano. She got on the piano and she said, Jesus loves me, this I know. She went, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the bad. And her home life, she was one of them that had a really bad one. And I was thinking how so innocent that child was. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We need to have Jesus do all these amazing things for us to know that God loves us and that Jesus cares about us. We... He wants to make sure that everybody in our family is taken care of. Like Job, the hedge of protection around him. We want to make sure that nothing is touched, nothing is borrowed. If someone gets sick, everybody gets healed. Um, if, if somebody is dying, we want them to be well. And if something happens that doesn't fit that, then we blame God and we say that God is not being fair. 
And yet, this child, which was many years younger than me, it's things that I've dealt with, and she got on there and she just put, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I was like, years from now, she actually realized what her family and her lifestyle was, and I wonder if she was still singing that same song. We often tell the Lord how we can show our love by keeping people alive around us. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, Paul asked the Lord for relief. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 through 10. This is after everything that's went on with his life. It says, Unless I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that I might that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my grace my, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in my infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul, if you want to continue with that same, what he was talking about, it was in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. Romans chapter 5, 3 through 6, it says, And not only so, but with glory and tribulations also, knowing that the tribulations worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. How many people here tonight have seen God's hand in your life? When there was no sign of hope. Can I see your hand? The second point is prayer. Now, I don't really know how to pray for this country. I don't know how to even to begin to pray about the, the people, what people are going through. Most of the time, it's hard for me to relate uh, to things. Uh, and show compassion. Um, so we rely on this verse a lot. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 28. Romans chapter 8, 26 through 28. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us while groanings which cannot be uttered, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know all things work together for good for them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. We read in this that all prayer is answered according to the will of God. How should we pray then? In Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 13, it tells us. Matthew chapter 6, 7 through 13. It says, But when we pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth the things that you have need of before you ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4. Psalm 139, 1 through 4. It 
Psalm 139, 1 through 4, it, it reads, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsetting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou composest my past and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word of my tongue, but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Getting back to the text, Jesus looked over the crowd with compassion because he saw us the way that we truly are as lost sheep. The lady at the well in John 4, 1 through 25, we're not going to go there, but the lady came to the well that was um, pretty far off, and you can just imagine people that knew her in the city, and they probably looked at her and said all kinds of evil things about her, and they said, we know there's this harlot that's going to give water at the well. Uh, she was with five men before the husband, and it's probably hard to say how many things that was said about her. But um, in John 4, verse 4, it said that Jesus must needs to go through Samaria. He must needed to go through Samaria to visit a, a woman at the well. Um, in verses 28 through 29 in the same chapter, it says, we knew that the woman uh, found out who Christ was and told um, all the men in the city what has been done. Most of the men that she probably talked to was uh, men that knew the type of woman that she was, what kind of history that she had. Um, but didn't, she didn't care about that. She met Jesus and she found his compassion. In prayer, Jesus knows everything about us we just went through, that he knows our uprising and our sitting downs. Um, scripture says to come to him boldly. I think that sometimes if you come to God and you ask Him something against His will, sometimes you can become bitter. Um, I've known people that's had death in their family and they haven't darkened the door of a church since then. Sometimes they go against, they, they go against everything that they went through because they blame God. Uh, so sometimes it's, it's very... You have to come to God with reverence and, and bring to your prayers, but ultimately it is God's will what happens. How many has, has prayed for somebody in their family to be saved for more than five years? Can I see your hand? Ten years? Twenty? Most of the time when we ask God, we use His Word to back it up. 2 Peter 3.9 Most of us know this, but 2 Peter 3.9 it says, The Lord is not slick concerning His promises as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 3-4 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, it says, But if our gospel be hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. When Satan looked at Job, he saw a target. He saw a guy that he saw a hedge of protection around him, and he says, I can't touch him because God won't allow me to. And God allowed him to touch it because he knew what kind of man that Job was. He knows what kind of men that we are too, and to a certain degree. We, most of our ways of coming to him is a lot of it's pride. Uh, as long as you can get somebody blinded to the grace of God, it's easy to keep them blind. Uh, sometimes they do it by good works. Sometimes people, they believe that, like I did, baptism saves you. Uh, I was blinded to any kind of love of Christ. There are some people out there that believe that the, observing the Ten Commandments can get them to heaven. Um, but also, uh, pride 
uh, can blind us as well. If we look through Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. Luke chapter 18, 10 through 14. says, two men went into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as the other men are exhorters and just adulterers, or even as the publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all I possess, and the publican standing afar off would not lift up as much as his eyes to heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Sometimes it's easy to look at somebody and not have compassion for them. It's easy to look at somebody and put them into different groups and say, well, that person's lost because they, uh, well, I know the history of that person. That person's no way he can be saved. Or Sometimes it's a family member. That, that person, you can give the last name of that person. Well, that is, you don't have any hope. And sometimes we ask more like the, the Pharisee than we do the publican. And we don't realize that God looked upon us with mercy when we needed him. And he saved us from the people that we were before we came to know Christ. Next is purpose. That's first, third, we're going to go over the three Ps. Um, Using Paul to start off, um, it's 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 15 through 16. It says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation uh, that Christ came unto the world to save sinners, of whom I am, I am the chief. Um, I think the reason why Paul was so vehement above helping others is he understood where he came from. He understood that he came persecuting sinners and he knew where he was before and he knew the mindset and stuff that he was in and he knew that he was the chief of sinners and he knew that he needed to look at others and see a different light. He saw them ultimately as sheep without a shepherd. We have to first understand where we came from on our own walk in order to show compassion for others. And in doing so, we need to understand different things that they're going through. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it tells us, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 through 4, it says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comfort us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them who are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. See, many things that we go through in our life, as far as losing loved ones, um, going through different tribulations that we have, coming together, uh, it says, don't ex I forget to, uh, what is that that says, they don't. Forget to the, your self-assembly together. We do it to uplift each other. And most of this is everything that we're going through right now. Um, we need a place that we can go to and we can say to each other, look, I've been there. Um, I understand what you're going through. I know that it's hard right now. But most of the time, you just need somebody that you can just cry with, somebody that you, you can laugh with, somebody that you can console with and not... The world that when I went through with other um, guys' sermon, people sometimes find themselves hope in alcohol and in drugs and in different pills and different things that they have. They don't know the first thing. Most of the kids that was here when I mentioned about the the parents, there's some kids out here have no family life whatsoever. They have no the only friends that they have. They're doing drugs. I think God allows Christians to go through stuff. So we can help each other. And even says it in 2 Corinthians 1, chapter 3 and 4. It's a blessing sometimes to go through horrible things. Because we can be 
a help to others. And we can say, we've been there. We understand where you're going through. Don't give up on God. My grandmother, she passed away in 2012. They uh, carried her down the steps. They had a rag on her. My, my neighbors was in the other room. They were talking about different things. And I remember watching her coming down the steps with a sheet over her. And um, <laughs> I had a satisfaction of knowing that she was saved. That I knew that I loved her and I showed it and I knew that she loved me. And it was a peace that I had, not that the fact that she died, but it was a peace that I had knowing that, that me and her shared this compassion with one another. However, in 2019, when my dad passed away, there was a lot of um, unanswered stuff. We don't have long on this earth. In James chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Wherein you know not what shall be of the morrow, but what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little while, a little time, and then vanishes away. Do you have family members that are lost? Do you have somebody that is sick? Do you know of somebody that needs help? Too often it's easy to look at somebody and not have compassion over them because sometimes we're too bothered about our own lives. Years went by with my dad. I knew my dad was baptized. And I knew I loved him. I'm pretty sure I knew that I loved him too. But I think one of the hardest things is not knowing that somebody died, but knowing that you didn't talk to them about stuff that actually mattered. Knowing what the president's going to be, knowing anything, it's all minute. Um, saving people, having compassion on them and sharing the gospel with them and you can't cure COVID. You, you can't really fix a lot of things. But if you've gone through something that is bad, you can look on somebody and you can have compassion over them. And you can share, I've been where you are. I can help you out. You know, do you know Christ as your Savior? You know, you can build them up and you can say like, you know, God is closer than a brother and he can help you. There are many things. If not, what else do they have? They have pills. They have alcohol. They have friends that's really not there for them. We need to have the look of compassion when we look around this world. It's easy to get lost and not seeing people lost without a shepherd. Jesus looked at the woman at the well and saw a woman that was in need of help. Looked at Paul, the chief of sinners, and saw him as an evangelist. Looked at a fisherman and Peter and saw him as a fisherman of men. I don't know what he saw in me when he saved me. I'm glad he looked at me with compassion now, and I'm glad that he revealed what he did as far as knowing the gospel. There's thousands in this world, millions even, wandering around and they're scattered and they're tired. In Jude 22, and some having compassion, making a difference. Let's pray.